Open your Bibles with me to 1 John as we continue in our uh, study through the book of 1 John. Uh, let me just say we're excited about the work day this next weekend in Mexico. Hope that many of you are able to come. Uh, last time we were together, remember that the Lord was sharing with us from John's first epistle that we need to keep our eyes on eternity and not on the things of this world. In 1 John in chapter 2, in the last verse that we were visiting, verse 17, it said, And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And so the idea given to us to be focused on the things of eternity and being with the Lord in heaven forever. And so we move into chapter 2 and verse 18. He says, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. And so the Apostle writes to us some 1900 plus years ago, speaking to us saying that the end time is near, the days are numbered, and that we need to recognize that Jesus' return is coming soon. And he makes sure to be able to tell us that by saying you're going to know this by what is upon you now, the Antichrist, or the spirit of the Antichrist, and many false teachers is what he is speaking about. Now nobody knows exactly the day and the hour in which the Lord is going to come for his church. That's surely told to us by Jesus himself, where he said, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 24. But what John is saying to us is that because of all that we see and the wickedness that is around us at the time that he was living, that these are signs of the end time and it approaching. How much closer are we then today? How much closer are we today as we see what he is speaking of, the Antichrist or the expression of the spirit of the Antichrist being all around us and us knowing the time. John is calling us to be those that know the time. Romans chapter 13 and 11 says this, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. And so we need to recognize, church, how important it is to know the time. As you're raising children, one of the important things for them to be taught is to know time. And for us, as children of God, to know the time according to the Scripture. And so he focuses on knowing that the Lord is coming again. He told us not to be given to the things of the world. Not to allow for them to lure us in to all kinds of sinful activity, but to be those that are focused on eternity and being with himself. And so since Jesus died and rose again, since that time that he is speaking of, John says, we're seeing people follow all kinds of false teachings. The Antichrist, if you will, is the premier of the liars, the false teachers that come to the earth embodied, if you will, even as Satan, the word in 2 Thessalonians said this, in chapter 2 and verse 9, the coming of a lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And so it amazes me that so many people are lured away from the truth of the gospel when we have the scriptures before us to be able to study and to be able to learn from? How do people fall into such absurd cults and fall away from the truth, not give way to the truth of the scripture that we hold in our hands today? Let me just mention a few of those just cults that are bewildering to me in 
some of their thinking and logic. Realism is a French cult that believes that extraterrestrial beings created us and are in full control of every move that we make today. Fall into that cult and see where it gets you. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 says that God is the one. He said, let us make man in our image. There is only one creator of man, and it is the Lord God Almighty. Amen? Amen. Mormonism. Joseph Smith's lies, teaching that God had many wives, and that's how the earth got so populated, and many pre uh, planets have population on them as well. He speaks even to this that Jesus is the brother of Satan himself. It, it is amazing to me. The Word of God, once again, from Genesis chapter 1, says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And so we know that the population has come from the creation of man by God himself and giving us the privilege of being able to have children. The Jehovah Witness, crazy some of their thinking. They believe that Jesus came to the earth and before he came to the earth, he was actually Michael the Archangel and became the Messiah when he was baptized. Scripture tells us, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall, give, uh, shall bear a child and shall bear his son. His name shall be named Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Amen. He wasn't Michael the archangel. He is God. And he is God incarnate. And the word of God is very clear to tell us that. The other one that's crazy to me because it's so close is the church of Scientology. This one just is as nutty as it can be. Listen to what their, their, their uh, marker is, if you will. Man is basically good and he's seeking to survive. And his survival depends on himself and attaining brotherhood with the universe. It is crazy to think of how people can be drawn away to the lie when we have the truth of God right here in our hands. The Word of God tells us that there is none good. No, not one. No man is not good. Man is sinful. And he needs a Savior. And the Savior is God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And we need to be given to Him. Last week when we were together, the Lord was speaking to us from John and He said, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life is how all are drawn away to temptation and leave the truth of God's world. All the false teaching lures people away in one of these three areas. And so John is speaking to us about the end times and he says as you see the signs coming more rapidly, how much more ready should you be? You and I, making sure that we are ready for the Lord's return. Verse 19, he says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. And so this verse really answered a lot of questions for me about people in ministry as I looked around and saw so many phony, false teachers in the world today. And I was always baffled by how people don't see the, the games and the showmanship that is being displayed in the realm of Christianity today. And this passage of Scripture made it very clear to me. He said that, you know, some, and I think it's important for us to recognize, though he's speaking about false teachers it can be related to us in the church today. Everyone here in the church today needs to hear this verse. Every one of us need to recognize that if you're apostate, if you go and continue to go out of the special fellowship that God has for all believers, probably you haven't committed your life to the Lord. 
Let me say that again. If you continually, habitually, you practice going out and being involved in the world and the things of the world, then you probably have not really ever committed your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you cannot say no and Lord in the same sentence. And so notice John is making a clear distinction as he speaks here between us and them. And observe with me if you will, just because you're here physically in the sanctuary does not mean that you are there spiritually with him. And it's important for us to be able to recognize and understand that. I don't think there's a place more clear in Scripture than when Jesus deals with Judas Iscariot himself and understanding that, that Judas Iscariot was with him and he was walking with him and he was seeing the ministry that was gone on. He was involved in miracles that were taking place. He was there, physically there, but he was never of him, never spiritually given to him. The Bible says it this way, Luke chapter 22 and verse 21. Behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Only Jesus and Judas knew that he was not with him. Only the two of them. So notice with me again, the apostle brings us back to that walking test rather than talking test. Many people can talk the talk of Christianity. But the Lord has called us to be those that walk the walk. He's called us to be those that live it out in our lives. That that the radical change of being born again really has us now determining, thinking on, and then acting according to his word. And when we don't, when we fall, that we're repentive, we're on our face before him begging forgiveness and getting back up, as he says, a righteous man will fall seven times, but will get back up. It is that the conviction of the Holy Spirit drives us to a place of us showing our love for the Lord by the way we live our lives before him. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we truly those that have committed our life fully to the Lord? That we have said to the Lord, listen, I am yours. And if that's true, then let me just say this. It will be proven out. If that's evident, it will be shown by the love for his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If it's really true of us, then it will be shown out in the way that we love our neighbor, in the way that we care for others, in the way that we're concerned about them. It will be proven out in the way that we see the Bible being so sweet to our taste that we can't get enough of his word and it's us feeding on it, of us serving others, and that none of this would be weariness to our flesh, that we would be those that find a joy in it even when the hours are long. Well, go back to verse 20 with me, if you will, and see that real Christians are anointed. The word says, but you, and so there is the contrast once again, taking us from the phony Christian to one that is true and real. He says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I love this text because the Word of God tells us very clearly that phony people don't, but real people do have an anointing from God Himself. The Bible tells us that in 2 Corinthians, in chapter 1 and verse 21, the Apostle Paul writes, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. It is God himself that has anointed us, or if you will, given us the very blessing of knowing Jesus Christ. Really striking contrast that we have here from antichrist to real Christian to anointed by God, being those that have the creator himself finding pleasure in us 
and then allowing for he himself, God the Holy Spirit, to indwell us so that we might be those that are born again and have the anointing of truth. And so let me give you a little explanation of that. I think it's important that the real guy or the true Christian has Jesus Christ in the rightful position. It's the one that we are subjected to, that's master of our life. And the Bible says that he's the truth. He's the answer. And so as we open the scripture, we see that what God is saying is we've been anointed to know all truth. We've been anointed to be able, by the power of the Holy Spirit now in our life, to discern between what is a lie and what is truth. Remember that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except by me. Once again, knowing all things, to know or to have a direct per perception of all things according to the Holy Scriptures, according to the Lord Himself. And so the Lord enlightens us. You know that. Don't you know that? That, that whenever you come to that, that time of question, that, that time when temptation is presented before you, or distraction even is presented before you, you have the Holy Spirit saying to you, Jerry Brown, don't you turn right. You make sure you turn left. Don't you go down that street. You make sure you go around the block. You know the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And He speaks very clearly to you with the truth. You have the discernment now of God Himself in you. What a blessing that is, church. We should be jumping up and down and shouting hallelujah right now. Amen. What a blessing it is to have God, the Holy Spirit, giving us that discernment. Well, look on in verse 21. He says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And that no lie is of the truth. And so John says once again, listen, you need to be recognizing that since being born again, the truth is evident to you. And there is no hiding it, if you will. He says, don't give way to false teachings. He's speaking to us. Remember in context about the end time showing because of so much false teaching that is going on and people wanting to draw others away from the truth of the scriptures. And so he just very clearly tells us that, look, God is spirit. And since the time that we've been born again, he is there to guide us into all truth, the Bible says. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10 for a moment. Let me take you to this. Because I think it's so, so important that we just hold fast to the truth. That, that, we, that we're not lured away by any lie because we are so strong in holding on to the truth. So given to being those that are fascinated by the truth that God gives us and how He shows us. His truth. Chapter uh, 10 and verse 23 of the book of Hebrews says this. Let us hold fast. The word is being spoken to us to be those that are completely given to not letting go. Hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Let there not be any wavering from it or distraction from it. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And so John's saying the day is coming. The day is short. And as we read from the book of Hebrews, the writer is saying, hold on. Make sure that you recognize with all the craziness that's going on and with what we've been told about the Antichrist, even by Satan's power being able to do miracles and deceive many, that we hold on to the truth of God's Word and so that we would not be deceived. And the rest of the chapter really gives us counsel on how important it is that we don't listen to teaching that's not 
truth. Look at with me in verse 22 as we go back to 1 John. He said, Who is a liar? But he who denies Jesus is the Christ. He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And so the statement covers a lot. John's statement includes everyone that denies Jesus is our high priest, the true, if you will, prophet, the king of kings, because it is all wrapped up in that title, Messiah, Christ, that he has. In Acts chapter 4, the apostle Peter would give that first message, remember, to the church after being born again. And he would say this in chapter 4 and verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so there is only one that can provide salvation. And there is only one that can say he is the truth. I want to make sure that we recognize that. Because the Bible says all men are liars. And so we have been now given the Holy Spirit, God Himself, to be able to help us recognize what is truth and what is a lie. And that we would only follow the truth. Buddha can't save you. The Pope can't save you. Chuck Smith can't save you. Jerry certainly can't save you. There is only one. And His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we need to be recognized and give way to that verse 23 says whoever denies the son does not have the father either he who acknowledges the son has the father also and so this is not some new teaching that we are seeing here but it is the teaching that John heard from Jesus himself in Jesus uh, in John's gospel he records Jesus in chapter 10 and verse 30 in saying this I and my father are one and so he's making sure to be able to say i'm god i i I am the eternal god i the father and god the holy spirit are one there's no way to separate you can't separate the sun from its brightness nor can you separate the sun from the father think about it for a minute because it's important that we recognize if there's no godhead there's no atonement And if there's no atonement, there's no redemption. It is only in Jesus Christ being recognized as God and anyone who says differently, all those cults that we just spoke about, anyone who says differently is a liar. And I love that about the Bible, that it's just straightforward. You're either a liar or you're a truth teller. That's what the Bible says. People want to say, oh, you shouldn't say that. That's a mean word. No, it's the truth. You're either a liar or a truth teller. And I love the Bible makes it that clear as we look at the Scripture. Look at verse 24 and 25. It says, therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He promised us, eternal life. And so I've told you this before, I I say it often, but the Word is very clear to show us as we look at this, that, that when we're talking about biblical things, we're talking about Scripture, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, know this, know this, it's not new. It is from the beginning John says. And so he's writing from the beginning of the time of Christ coming to the earth and him being God incarnate, speaking the truth of the scripture to us about how it is that we're to follow him and to be able to enter into the kingdom of God. It is that the gospel has been so clearly given to us now that it's not a shadow from the Old Testament any longer, but it is open and plain and easy and clear so that we don't have any excuse and that we would hold fast to it. Remember John chapter 1 and verse 14 where the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John says, from the beginning of that time, 
God, Jesus himself, becoming man, dwelt among us. And he says that if we abide in him, then we abide also in the Father. Turn to John's Gospel for a moment, would you please? And to John's Gospel, chapter 15. Because as we look at this word, it's so important for us to be able to have understanding of it. And, and I want you to hold your place there in 1 John, because we're, we're going right back to it. But I want to make sure that we see this little word with so much meaning. That word is if. And first John said, uh, John said, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you. If what you heard abides in you. In John 15, in chapter uh, uh, verse 5, Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If, he says, anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. I want to make sure that we see that little big word, if, in both the epistle and in the gospel. In the gospel we have the little if given to us from Jesus himself. As we move to the epistle, it is John, inspired by God the Holy Spirit, to write, showing us that little if. It means that you and I have a choice. It means that we can either be given to or not and rebel against. But we get to make that decision. And the scripture is just calling us to make that decision over and over again. And nothing has changed since the time of Jesus speaking about it in this way, that all mankind will have the opportunity to either put their trust in him, believe in him or not. But I want to make sure that you recognize, go back to 1 John and look at what it says at the end of verse 25. It said, here's a promise. If you choose him, if you're committed to him, if you're given to him, if you're abiding, the word of God means to live in him in Christ Jesus, you abide and live in the Father. And he says, here's the promise, eternal life. Eternal life. We get to look forward to that time of being with him for eternity. Here's the blessing. The moment that we come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we enter into the abundant life that Christ has given to us dying on the cross. Amen? And so we get to experience, amen, we get to experience the abundant life right now, right here. And one day, huh, yeah, one day, man, the icing on the cake, we get to be with him for all of eternity. Amen? Amen? That's what's waiting for us. That's what the word says. In John's gospel, in chapter 17, he records Jesus praying, and he records him saying this, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Lord, it is by us putting our trust, church, in him. It's by us giving way to him, us committing our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ that he is speaking about, and then we have the truth that is in us. Verse 26, he says, These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. And so John is making mention of the evil ones that try to deceive, have all kinds of different, if you will, reasons for, have all kinds of different agendas, all of them given to self. The only reason that one would come away from the truth of the Scripture to deceive anyone is for selfish reason. And so the cults are all full of selfish people for selfish reasons, giving and steering people away from the truth. And so we need to understand that this truth is one that we need to be committed to. And the apostles, once again, love this about the Lord, full of grace and sharing with us. Here's the warning, church, is what he's saying. I want to make sure that you're aware that there are those who will try to deceive you. Verse 27, 
But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you. God the Holy Spirit now abides in you. And the anointing that God has given us is He Himself coming into our lives, sealing us until the day of redemption and being our helpmate that will guide us into all truth. He says, And do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in Him. And so He makes sure to tell us that His promises, He'll never leave us nor forsake us. That God has given us the Holy Spirit to dwell indwell all mankind that commit to Him, to Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. And because of that, the truth is in us. We will know the truth. The discerning spirit, if you will, of God Almighty will allow for us to know if one's trying to deceive us or not. I want to make sure that we recognize this, church. He says that the Holy Spirit is our perfect teacher. He's not saying that we're not to have any other teachers or to listen to teachers that teach the Scripture. But he's saying we need to make sure they're teaching the Scripture. We need to make sure that those that we're sitting under are those that are simply giving explanation of what the Scripture says and that they're going through the whole Bible. One of the things that drives me nuts is people that don't go through the Bible. They go to certain parts and, and they'll have you know 10 or 12 uh, messages that they perfect and they're eloquent in speaking and they don't teach the whole counsel of God. Paul said that he was innocent of the blood of all men because he did not shun to teach the whole counsel of God. To take those that are under your care through the whole of Scripture. But this Bible is saying right now to us, this text, that it is we need to check and make sure that whoever we're sitting under is teaching according to Scripture. Turn to Acts for a moment and to chapter 17. One of my favorite verses here in the Bible is Acts chapter 17. The Apostle Paul, remember the great Apostle Paul, and I say that with just a, an admiration for all that he went through and how he stood fast on the truth of Jesus. And I, and I love to be able to say this. Even him speaking and teaching in Berea had the Bereans doing this in verse seven, or chapter 17. Look at verse 11. These were fair minded, uh, more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And so even with the Apostle Paul being the preacher, and him being the one that delivered the message. The Brians were ones that studied the scripture to make sure that what the Apostle Paul was saying was what the Lord God Almighty had to say himself. And so John is saying that by the Holy Spirit, when we're born again, we'll have the discernment to know whether the teaching is true or that it is a lie. And one more thing is we, before we leave this verse, I want you to see the practicality in it. It says this, even as it taught you, you shall abide in him. And so he says, these truths have been given to you so that you might live them out. The truths haven't been given to you so you might be puffed up in the knowledge that you have of the truths. It's not so that you could show how, how good your memory is and being able to recite these verses but it is that you would walk them out that you would learn to be obedient to them and practice what they teach verse 28 and now little children abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming and so once again, I love how clear the Bible is. He says, the Lord's coming. And when he comes, you're going to fall into one of two categories. Those that are ashamed or those that are confident. The ones that are confident are going to be those that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him being Messiah. 
And the ones that aren't will be those that rebel against that truth and then suffer the consequences of their rebellion. Verse 29, as we finish up. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And so the word of God says that right living before God is proof text of you being born again. And let me make this clear. I want to make sure that we hear this. He didn't say those that think they're good. No, he said those that live righteously before God. And so we need to make sure that we understand that being right before God is being those that are ready to confess that we're sinners in need of a Savior. That put our trust and belief in Jesus Christ as God incarnate coming to the earth, dying on a cross to forgive us of our sins, and rising again to prove that He is God and overcame sin and death. It is that we would be righteous as we commit our lives to Him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord, and all that you want to speak to our lives. May you, God, be the one that shows us clearly what is truth and what is a lie. And Lord, that we would be so obedient to your truth, so given to your truth, so much studying your truth, that we would be able to recognize easily recognize when a lie was being presented before us. And that we would not be distracted and not fall away from your truth. Lord, I pray that as we hear those words, we think of you speaking out and saying, I am the way, the truth, Jesus. And that all would know that this whole message is about being given to you. And allowing for the truth of who you are and your redemption for mankind that would put their trust in you. The Lord would hold us fast and not let us be swayed away. God, let us be those that abide in you, I pray.